Father, we thank you for the words that have already been spoken today. Lord, we thank you for your presence here today. And I pray, Father, that as you use me as your servant, Lord, that you will just allow the words that come from my mouth, Lord, to be the words that you would have your people hear. You will soften our hearts, Lord, that we can hear what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Everyone could turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23 is where we're going to be today for the next 45 minutes. Um, You know, it's interesting that Rick went ahead and shared the trailer on the war room because what we're going to be talking about today is war. And it has to do with David and his mighty men. David, King David, had many mighty men. He had a list of 37 of them, to be exact, in this chapter of 2 Samuel. And what's interesting about his mighty men is they weren't just a bunch of small people. They were strong, robust, full of strength. Not just full of strength, but here's, here's the key. They were full of God. They had God on the inside of them. And as we read about a few of these, you're going to see a little bit about what God wants for us as warriors in his kingdom. We're going to start in verse 8, 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. It's all good. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. And I'm going to do the best I can to pronounce these names. I've already tortured Dawn this morning with having to read through some of them. But these are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joshub, Basabeth, the Tachmanite, chief of the three. He was called Adino, the Esnite, because of the 800 he killed at one time. 800 at one time. Let's look in verse 9. And after him was Eleazar. He was the son of Dodo, the Aohite, one of the three mighty men with whom David, with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle, and the men of Israel had gone up. He arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and until his hand clung or was welded to the sword. And Jehovah worked a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And the next was Shema, the son of Agi, the Herite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood in the middle of the ground and delivered it and killed the Philistines. And Jehovah worked a great victory. Might I add, the reason he did that is because he knew that ground belonged to God. And he wasn't going to let anybody take it. Verse 13. And three of the thirty chief men went down and came to David in the harvest time into the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of the giants. And David was then in a stronghold, and the fort of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that someone would give me a drink from the water of the well of Bethlehem by the gate. And the three mighty men broke through the army of the Philistines, drew water out of the well of Bethlehem by the gate, and took it and brought it up to David. But he would not drink it, but poured it out to Jehovah. And he said, Be it far from me, O Jehovah, that I should do this. Is it not the blood of men who went in danger of their lives? And he would not drink it. These three mighty men did these things. He had these three mighty men who were those who stood by him. There were three. Now, three is very symbolic. We know in Scripture it talks about the three-stranded cord that is not easily broken. There's something about the number three. Hello, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Where two or more are gathered. Well, if you're two and God's one, how many is that? There is something about three. He had three mighty men 
that he worked with on a regular basis. Now, there were others. There were a total of 37, but these three were very, very specific to David. They were set as the heads. Now, let's go on to verse 18. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief among three. So he was over three others. And he lifted up his spear against 300 and killed them and had the name among three. In other words, he was honored above those three. Surely he was honored more than the three, and he was their commander. However, he did not attain to the first three, or those three that were ideally the top three that were with David. Verse 20, And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada from Kabzeel, a son of a mighty man, great in deeds, First, he killed two lion-like men of Moab. Second, he went down and also killed a lion in the middle of a pit in the time of snow. Verse 21, third, he killed an Egyptian, a man of form, means he was not a very small person, he was very large. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with the staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among the three mighty ones. He was more honorable than the thirty, and he had himself a name among those three. But he did not attain to the first three, and David set him over his guard. He was the man. Jesus, when we look at Scripture, we're always looking for types and shadows. David is a type of Jesus in Scripture. He was not only a king, he was a priest. When we look at this particular person in verse 20, Benayana, I guess is how you say it, Benaiah, Benaniah. He was so amazing, and I believe that this person was set over his other mighty men for a reason. And we look through scripture, and we go through these names, and now I'm not going to torture you by going all the way through the rest of this chapter, because he lists all the names. Spencer, would you like to read them? No, you had that big smile on your face, I was just going to say. We go over them. When we're reading the Bible, we oh, that's nice, and we keep reading, and we pass up some very pertinent information. This movie could not have come out at a better time. It could not have come out at a better time. Because in the heavenlies, how many of you have been sensing, even before this movie came out, that it is time to sit, get in your closet and fight the battle on your knees? This battle that we're in is not a battle where you can walk through the door and we can come in and we can just sit down and we can sing a few worship songs and then go on out. This battle we're in is not a battle that everything's just going to be okay and we just go in and out of every little circumstance and we complain to our friends and our family about how horrible our life is and then we look at it and we're like, oh, yeah, well, we, we believe in God and God's there. Praise the Lord. We have a huge part in what we're dealing with. Because the Bible wouldn't say we fight against what? Not against. Not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of this dark age. Are you fighting? What are you fighting? Yourself? Your spouse? Your children? Your pastors? Your fellow believers? Who are we fighting against? Things that are unseen. But if we do not hear the Lord speaking and we don't know his voice, because he says, my sheep will know my voice and a voice of another they will not follow. They will not follow a voice of another. So I want to encourage you, if you have not been praying and seeking him and asking him to speak fresh to you, now's the time. Get familiar with his voice. Just as that small baby needs to learn the voice of its parent, it is time for us as believers to know God's voice. Now let's look at this 
Benaniah. First of all, he killed two lion-like men of Moab. I don't know if they had this massive beard going on or whether they were just, you know, crazy, angry, vicious type people, but when they say lion-like, think of a lion. Okay. Moab in Scripture has been a symbol of flesh. Moab, the Moabites were a nation on the borders of Israel. They were related to the Israelites. But remember when Lot fled Sodom and Gomorrah, or Sodom? He hid in a cave with his two daughters, and some of us know what happened there. And one son that was born of that father with his daughters was named Ammon, and the other one was named Moab. They took matters into their own hands. Those girls decided, you know what? I don't know how in the world we're going to have any other kids in this world. Let's just take care of that. Moab has always been symbolic of flesh manifesting. It's referring to our selfish life. Us trying to do things out of our own power. Right? We're not to give in to those things, right? What are the three things that we war against? Our flesh. Oh, come on, guys. The world, see, I didn't say it in the right order. That's why some of you probably didn't get it. The world, the flesh, and the devil. This is symbolic of the flesh. The second thing he did, he went down, and he also killed a lion in the middle of a pit when it was snow, in a time of snow. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you would like for me to just have this big pit here, and I throw you in it, and then throw a line in on top of you. Okay. It would be the pits, wouldn't it? <laughs> you better know God. But that's not where it stopped. It was during a time of snow. I don't know about you, but... I can't walk on snow and ice very carefully. So getting a foothold in that kind of a situation can be very difficult. This man killed the lion in that pit. Now remember, this is the man who was set as the leader over David's mighty men. So here we have him fighting the flesh, the Moabites. We have him fighting the devil, because the word says the devil roams around like what? A roaring lion. He also killed an Egyptian in verse 21. A man of form, a very large man. And the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. And he went down to him with his staff. That's all Ben and I took was a staff. And instead of beating him to get, you know, down with the staff, he plucked the spear out of the dude's hand and killed him with his own spear. Okay? This is symbolic of a picture of the world. Here you have the world, the flesh, and the devil. All three. Now, you can read scripture and you can just breeze over the names. You can breeze over the locations. You can just glance at it or you can study to show yourself approved. That doesn't mean I know everything. Doesn't mean you know everything. What it means is when we take time and we really pray and we really seek the Lord, he's going to show us these things. And I'm telling you, this is the book of life. This book right here is the book of life. First it's natural, then it's Spiritual. Spiritual. Now, a lion is considered one of the most dangerous of all the enemies. I mean, think about a lion. There's a reason why he's called the king of the beasts. A typical male lion is anywhere from 350 to 500 pounds of muscle. It's either anywhere, anywhere from three and a half feet tall, nine feet long, from nose to tail. With one blow of his paw, he can smash a human skull. 
bam, you're out. One of the strongest bones in our body can be smacked that quickly by a lion if we're not paying attention. With its jaws, it can bite through any bone in the human body. Not only did Benaniah meet a lion, but he met it in the worst possible place. I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to face the lion in the pit? Benaniah had a lot of training, folks. He was with David when he was running from Saul. They were camped out in the, cli the cliffs and the rock. This man and his other mighty men worked out not only in the natural but in the spiritual. They believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The challenge is here for us as a body of believers. Are we willing to step up to the plate and fight this war? And it's not a war of flesh and blood. It is a war, a spiritual war. Well, I don't know how to fight spiritually, some people would say. It starts by taking the time to turn off your television, turn off the electronics, and get one-on-one -on -one with God. I have had to learn to get one-on-one -on -one with God. How many of you in here know how busy I am? Yeah, a lot of you know how busy I am. I can't do what I do without eat, sleeping, breathing, my God. I can't. There's no way. People say, I don't know how you do it. Well, guess what? I can't unless I'm doing what I'm supposed to in the Spirit. I can't do those things unless I am focused on Him. Or I'd have been burned out a long time ago. Now, I have the pleasure of having Pastor Cindy here today. Cindy was one of my Bible teachers back in the day when I was in Bible school. But not only was she my teacher, she was my friend. I say was. She still is. Facebook is a wonderful thing. <laughs> If you don't know what to do to war against the enemy that is bombarding you, talk to somebody, a leader, a teacher, someone who can get in there and pray with you. Rumors back to me on, you know, Deborah and her incredible prayer on Friday. I mean, what a prayer warrior. Deborah will be happy to pray for you. There's many people. Raise your hand if you like to pray and you will be willing to pray with people. All right, hold them up high. Now look around this room and you find somebody. If you need prayer, you find somebody and you call them. We've got the directory back there and intercede with that person until you feel like you can walk. Amen? It is time to go to the gym. And everyone said, <laughs> Amen. All right. One of the things that, um, you know, in, with the youth group, and I like to teach it. Floyd, would you come up here for a second? Can you stand right here? I'm not going to hurt you. Don't act like I'm going to hurt you. Are you serious? One of the things I like to teach our youth is this. My husband here, how hard do you think it would be you can walk forward. You can get a little closer. Here, let me hold your hand. How hard do you think it would be for me to pull you off that? I barely moved my foot. Well, of course, you went in with it, you know, because that's just how you are. But how difficult would it be for him to pull me up there? It's going to be a lot harder, okay? If I am a Christian... And I'm standing right here. This is our Christian. And I am a non-believer. How easy is it going to be for me to pull him down off these steps versus him pulling me up there? Bad company corrupts good morals. The first step in fighting the battle you have is who you have around you. Have a seat. Who do you have around you? Who is your support network? David had three mighty men. 
Not to mention, you know, the others that were there too. Who are you putting in your circle of friends? Are they people that want you to go out, let's have a drink, and let's go carry on and do our thing, and then you're laughing, and next thing you know, you're talking about stuff you know you shouldn't be talking about. What are you putting around yourself? That doesn't mean you're not the Christian who reaches down to encourage someone and lift them up. But you better be standing firm when you do it. Staying in the word, knowing his voice, understanding what he wants you to do. Amen? When King David was on his deathbed, he asked Benaniah to help his young son, Solomon. Under King Solomon, Benaniah became his counselor, his commander of the army that brought all the wealth and peace to Israel. Benaniah's trouble, his problems, his circumstances, everything he went through was ordained by God to build the character in him. The battles he went through, the struggles he went through was doing what? Building character in him. How many of you in here are going through struggling and you know God's trying to build some character in you? How many of you don't know he's trying to build character in you? <laughs> now you know. He is doing that for you right now. Well, I don't understand why I'm going through this situation. Why me? Why not you? Why not you? You know, Rachel shared in the newsletter, if you go to page 15 in your newsletter, 14 in your newsletter, and it talks about the, the child who was blind. And they're like, oh, they were talking, what sin did the parents commit that caused this child to be blind? It's like none. This child is blind so that the glory could come to my father. So he, he heals him. He heals the man. He, it, we are in a fallen world. I am preaching to the choir. You guys understand that. But the war is not against flesh and blood. It is against the enemy. In this time right now that we're going through, we need to first recognize God brought me here. I realize that through circumstances in our lives, we can make bad choices and we end up in situations we shouldn't be in. I get that. But there are times when you're walking with the Lord that you end up in situations that you had no idea you were going to have to go through. God brought you there. It is by his will that I'm in that place. Next, we have to realize that God's going to keep you here in that place, in his love, and he's going to give you the grace to overcome this trial. And all we need to do, as pastor says, it's simple, not complicated, is behave like his child. Just obey his word. Then we need to realize that God is going to make that trial a blessing. If we start thinking differently, like Charles was saying, think differently about the situations you are in. Stop having regrets about where you are, where you've been. Start thinking differently about where you are now. This trial is ultimately going to be a blessing. And God can bring you out of it at any time. God is in the, in the business of building mighty men and women. Benaniah is a type of the church. If David was a type of Christ and Benaniah was a co-worker with David, we, as the body of Christ, are to be warriors. I would like for someone to raise their hand and tell me, as Christians, how are you supposed to war? What exactly do you do when you're, when you're warring against the enemy? Who, who knows how to war against the enemy? Spencer? Pray unceasingly. Pray unceasingly. Deborah? Take captive every thought. Cast it down. Amen, Pastor. Know your weapons. 
Know your weapons. Everybody know Ephesians chapter ah, 6. Good. Who else? Ma'am. Praying in the Spirit. How many of you have forgotten to speak in tongues? Building yourself up in your most holy faith. There are diversities of tongues. It's not just your prayer language. There are warring tongues that go on. Talk to me afterwards if you need a teaching on it. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Is that what you're going to say? What else? Standing on his promises, obedience to his word. Yes, ma'am. Praying God's word. That's right. He will honor his word. Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was tempted on the mount, what did he use? Yes, sir. Know this, that greater is he that is us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I learned this at, at um, LFM. If I had a little uh, calling forward of everyone and I said, if you want power, stand in this line. If you want purity, stand in this line. Everybody wants to function in the power of God. But we don't realize if you're not in this line, if you're not going through the purity, obeying God, honoring his word, holding true to his promises, this is never going to happen. So if you want to be effective as a prayer warrior, it is time to draw the line in the sand. It is time to just submit to him. It is so much easier to go with God than to fight him. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Humility. Humble yourself. And what is that, the whole thing about the, um, in James, where it talks about the roaring lion. Resist him. Well, he wants us to do that, and we just jump right in it and start doing it. We don't even resist, because we let our flesh take over. It sounds to me like, you know, we have to fight like Benaniah against the world, the flesh, and the devil that wants to come in and have its way with us. As we go on in 2 Samuel chapter 23, I looked up every single name of every single one of his mighty men. And I want to tell you just some of the characteristics of his mighty men. And these are the characteristics that God is wanting to impart into you as you walk with him, as you pray, as you seek his face. These are the things that he's going to build inside of you spiritually so that you can fight against the enemy. Amen? Strength, mighty, God has made. stupefy or make amazed you're going to stand out among your friends you're going to stand out among people they're going to be like whoa what's up with that person wakefulness opening eyes strength to pull off to strip and deliver a father of help to build up to shade like a refuge. To be liquid or flow easily. Oh, you guys are going to get me preaching. To flow easily. If we are, and this goes hand in hand with Pastor Bob's message on the very front cover of the newsletter, if we are to be stones jointed together, jointly fit together, Precious stones. If we're too precious, we're not going to fit. We're, we're not going to want to be. We're going to be more individualized and do our own thing. And, but when we are 
put together with our brothers and sisters. We're joined, fitly joined together. I don't mind if, if Rachel's in front of me, if Floyd's here, or you're above me. or blo- It doesn't matter where we're all fit together. But the point is being fit, flowing easily with each other, with our giftings and our callings. I'll, most of you in here, I have known the whole 20 years I've been here. I know you. You know me. And I believe the majority of us flow pretty well together when it comes to things. If there's a person that comes in that needs help, we're all like, Phew. you know, we all use our own gifts in, in the way that God would have us use. But we don't need to let the enemy come in and say, oh, well, this rock doesn't need to be here. Let's put that rock way over there and isolate them where they have no support. So if you ever start feeling that way, well, no one understands me, and I don't you know, belong, and I don't fit in, that's the time you need to do battle against the enemy and let him know, hey, you know what? I'm not letting you pull me away. I'm not letting you cause me to have conflict with my brothers and sisters. So to be fluid or to flow easily. Prompt. The richest or choicest part to build a praise, a cry, father of strength, valiant. To do secretly, God will hide. That one was interesting. God will hide you. He will make you invisible to your enemies in the spirit realm. He is going to build that inside of you where you won't even recognize it at times because sometimes you don't need to know. And it's okay, because you're strong enough and you can handle it. A mother as a bond of the family, a brother of the mother, to escape strength, God of deliverance, God of the people, an enclosure to redeem, buy back, to build, repair. One of them's name meant snort, snorting, or snorer. Totally not even on subject. Through the idea of opening the eyes. Again, wakefulness. Did you know that one of those mighty men was Uriah, the Hittite? Uriah the Hittite is last on this list. And I wondered, is he last on the list because... I mean, I just thought it was interesting. I mean, I could sit here and speculate, but he was last on the list. And you guys remember the story about King David. All his mighty men are out to battle, and he sees Bathsheba. And he says, aha, I want that one. Bring her in. The next thing you know, Bathsheba says, I'm pregnant. So King David's freaking out. He's like, well... We need to cover this up somehow. Let's get Uriah to come back in from out in the war and let him come and stay with his wife. Everything will be okay. Well, Uriah comes back, and he sleeps at the entrance to the king's palace with all the servants. And he didn't go to his house. And when people told David, hey, Uriah didn't even go to his house, David said, have you not just come from a long journey? Why did you not go to your house? And Uriah said this. This is one of his mighty men. This is what God is building on the inside of us. The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in huts, temporary shelters. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Should I go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. David wasn't happy with that. He tried to get him drunk. Maybe he'll go see his wife after he's had a few. Well, that didn't work either. So what did he do? He said, put him on the front line. And he even said why, so that he will be killed. This is a man after God's own heart, folks. And you think that you're not good enough because of what your regrets are back there? Seriously? 
He was a man after God's own heart. He changed his heart condition. He prayed. He sought the Lord. God forgave him, and he left it behind him, and he went forward in his life. And God called him a man after his own heart. So don't beat yourself up. It's a lie from the enemy. Don't believe it. Amen? Know those who work among you. Know those who are in the fellowship. The leaders, people that you're sitting next to. Get to know their gifts. Get to know their callings. Get, continue to pray with one another. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Amen? Everyone turn to Romans 8. Oops. Romans 8. This will be the last scripture. We're going to start in Romans 8, verse 31. And how many of you have not seen the movie War Room yet? Raise your hands, please. Wow, you guys could have a party and just go. There was a church locally who went to go see the movie. They got us, after the watch the movie, they got as far as the foyer, and every one of them fell on the floor and started worshiping and praying right there in the middle of the movie theater. Amazing. Really, please go see this movie. And not just watch it and say, oh, that was a good movie. Put it into practice, and what I've shared with you today will make a lot of sense. Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to all this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be our foe if God is on our side? Verse 31. He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but he gave him up for all of us, will he not also with him freely and graciously give us all other things? Verse 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect when it is God who justifies that is, who puts us in right relation to himself. What shall come forward and accuse or impeach those whom God has chosen? Will God, who acquits us? Verse 34. Who is there to condemn us? Will Christ Jesus, the Messiah, who died, or rather who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, actually pleading as he intercedes for us? Verse 35. Who shall ever separate us from Christ's love? Shall suffering and affliction and tribulation or calamity or distress or persecution or hunger or destitution or peril or sword? Even as it is written, for thy sake we are put to death all the day long. How many of you are putting your flesh down? Every day, day in, day out. As Pastor Jan would say, flesh is flesh. Don't matter whose bones it's on. It's going to act like flesh. We are regarded and counted as sheep for the slaughter. Romans, okay, yeah, verse 37. We're going to go to 39. Yet amid all these things, we are more. Say more. more. How do you spell more? More. More. Than conquerors. I don't know about you, but these mighty men of God that were David's mighty men were more than conquerors. 800 people at once, 300 people at once. Whoa. We are more than a conqueror. Now think about King David. He slew Goliath. And all these mighty men are with David now. And they're facing the Philistines. Do you think they had any fear of the Philistines? They were with David. David killed the chief of the Philistines, the biggest guy out there. This is like a party for them. They had no fear. And I'm mentioning that because if you're more than a conqueror, we don't need to have any fear. Because guess what? Jesus overcame our enemy just like David overcame the Philistine enemy 
And those people that were with him, the mighty warriors had no fear because they were with the man of the hour. You will have Jesus in your life. He is your king. And he'll take care of it. You're more than conquerors. And gain a surpassing victory. Surpassing victory. Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded beyond doubt. I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things impending or threatening, the what-ifs, nor things to come, nor powers, none of it, no height, no depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Amen. Nothing. Just know that the war you're in, the battles you go through, God is allowing it for a reason. What are we going to learn from it? Spend some time with the Lord. Some of us are facing some very crucial decisions in life. Where to live, where to work. God's already told you what to do. You have to step out in faith and believe what he has told you to do. Because he knows what's in store for you. You don't. Not everything. He can show you bits and pieces of the future. Just like Satan only knows bits and pieces of the future. But God knows. Get in the closet. Make those decisions based on God's word and on your relationship with him. And you will not go wrong. Amen? Amen. Amen. Pastor Bob.